some noise. Come on, make some noise. Woo! So excited you guys are here. It's my favorite day of the week with my favorite people, my extended family, the church family, man. We get to come in here and be in God's house. It's something that we don't have to do. It's something that we get to do. And I'm super excited that we get to do this together today. And I keep sending you emails about like, would you please not come to the 10 service? And, and this service just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger every time I send that email out. And, and I wanna say, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm super glad. And I'm, I'm glad to see that Mark and Ada, who used to sit right here in this section on the front row, you just guys, you're like, you're like four rows back, man. I don't even know where you're at. The students are taking over. Can we get a, yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. We got kind of a student takeover taking over. And, and Mark, I'll see you in the, in the lobby out there, man. They're just going to keep pushing you back. Uh, we're excited about what's going on with students. couple quick things before we jump in. I, I want to just go ahead and tell you that God is doing a revival in our church. Like every single week we're seeing more and more people come into a relationship with him and just give their life to Jesus. There's hope in Jesus Christ, guys. If you're here today and you're like searching, you're not sure, there is hope in Jesus Christ and people are finding Jesus and it's, it's transforming their life. And, and I believe that God doesn't make mistakes. You're here today on purpose, on purpose to hear every single part of everything that we do here in this place because God's wanting to have a conversation with you. And it's really pretty cool. A couple things that are coming up before we jump into the message. Uh, next Sunday, next Sunday, yeah, next Sunday is our annual Trunk or Treat event. We're gonna have over a thousand people here and we're gonna be having a blast with games and face painting and candy. And you guys, so many of you have signed up to decorate trunks, but we're still looking for 10 to 12 more people to sign up for a trunk. And listen, we really need you to do it by today so we can know what's going on for next Sunday. If you do, you know, wait till next Sunday, it'll be a little harder for us to figure out where to put you. And so we're mapping everything out this week. If you haven't signed up, all you gotta do is text the word trunk to the number 31996. Text trunk to 31996. It's always a blast every year. And can I just say, 2020 has been a very difficult, rocky road year. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Can I get an even better amen, somebody? Like, amen. if you've never been able to amen in the church, we can all agree that 2020 has been a, quite a ride. It's been a roller coaster. And I believe that our community is gonna come out in drones this year because they've been cooped up, unable to do anything. And, and we're gonna be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're gonna, we're gonna be those, not those weird Christians, but we're just gonna be like kind of regular Christians, right? And then they're gonna go, oh man, you know, these people aren't as weird as I thought they were. And perhaps I maybe fit into this family too. And so if you haven't signed up, again, if you're a husband wife combo, we're expecting so many people, we'll park you right next to each other, but we'd love for you to do two trunks and not just one, okay? Do two and not just one. We really do need the help. With that being said, I told you people's lives are being transformed. Uh, we, we, we made a graphic that says baptism celebration is every third Sunday. But ever since we made this graphic and promoted it, we baptize people every single week. And so it's been like unreal what God is doing. If you, if you missed this morning, we actually baptized this morning. Right before you guys came in here, we baptized uh, somebody. It was super exciting to watch people take their next steps. And if you need to take your next step for baptism, I want you to text the word baptize, baptize to 31. 996, text BAPTIZE to 31996 and we can schedule your baptism as well. With that being said, we're in the final week of a message series called You Want Me To Do. What? We can do so much better than that. You want me to do what? You want me to do what? Well, today the message is I want you to choose blessed over stressed. I want you to choose blessed over stress. So if you're taking notes, that's the title of the message today. There's really two types of people in the room. There are those that are living the blessed life and there are those that are living the stressed life. Let me give you a little picture of what the stressed life looks like, okay? I believe that y'all, we have our Bibles on our phone, but we also have social media on our phones. So we scroll through our news feeds and we see all sorts of stuff. And you know, we look and we go, are you kidding me right now? They got a brand new car. Like, how did they get a brand new car? This is frustrating to me. Like, I'm looking at them, I'm, I'm like, I'm older than them. They're younger than me. Like some of these teenagers, they got brand new cars. I'm like, how did they get a brand new car, right? As I look at that, I get a little, little spirit of jealousy in me. A little spirit of jealousy, I get frustrated. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Or I'm scrolling through. These people, they just got their house remodeled. Are you kidding me right now? I can't believe they got their house remodeled. 
How can they afford to do that? We can't afford to do that. And I want to do that. And so we get this mindset of like selfishness and, and sometimes it's greed. Sometimes it's like, hey, dude, I want to get more and more in life. And so we look and we're like, are you kidding me right now? Coach Kevin got a boat. Are you kidding me? He got a boat. I've wanted a boat my whole life. I've been dreaming for this moment and he got a stinking boat, right? Now I gotta go be friends with Kevin so he can let me on the boat, <laughs> right? We look at this stuff, we're like, you guys, it's, and, and what's happening is, and I believe it's swept across all of our communities, all nationwide, we have what I call a spirit of poverty. We battle an evil spirit of poverty. And when I say I want you to not be stressed, instead I want you to be blessed, I'm gonna teach you out of the Bible today uh, how to live the blessed life instead of the stressed life. There's a lot of people in this room that, man, you're, you're battling this spirit of poverty. And I, I mentioned it's an evil spirit because it's not a godly spirit. It's a spirit that, that kind of looks like this. It, it's like you can keep working hard, working hard, working hard. You're working a lot. You're even getting paid pretty decently, but it seems like no matter how hard you try, it, you, you can never pull ahead. You can never pull ahead. Think about it like this. Um, uh, so when I'm scrolling through my newsfeed, sometimes I meet people at church and I'm like, oh, are you on Facebook? And they're like, yeah, I'm on Facebook. And I'm like, let me friend you. So I, I, I hit the friend request and I go home and I'm like, okay, so-and-so accepted my friend request. I just met him. And I look at their profile picture. And I'm like, dude, that doesn't even look like them. Y'all done this before? You meet somebody and you're like, I see your photo. I see what you're presenting but this doesn't match the real product. Can I get a better amen on that? Okay, like I see that. And what I've realized is that people are really good at only letting us see what they want us to see. They live their life with a filter attached to it. They only want us to see the boats, the cars, the awesome house that they got, the vacation that they do. How come they get to take a vacation? Anthony, I didn't get to go on a vacation. Why'd you get to go on a vacation? You know, so like, they see only what they let us see but here's what I've noticed, those filters that they have on, they're not real. Because if I was to tell you the real story behind those types of things that we're looking at, those people are really battling a spirit of poverty. See, what they don't show you is that they're in debt up to their eyeballs. They can't breathe. And it's not that they're going to work because they wanna go to work and make some money. It's they're going to work because they have to go to work because they got bill after bill after bill to pay for. They're going out of obligation at this point. And so we don't fully see the real picture when we're just scrolling through our newsfeed. And they're living in a spirit of poverty. Spirit of poverty, if I could sum it up the best, is it's almost like a hamster in a hamster wheel running really, really fast and going nowhere. That's a spirit of poverty. Now, when I teach like this, Anthony, you, you know, lots of people, they, they get quiet. They get real quiet because they're like, oh, I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. And guys, I don't want you to live in that mentality. There is an answer to this. So what is the answer? The answer is giving. And I could have chosen any single word that I wanted to put up here on the screen, but I believe biblically the best way I can describe living the blessed life instead of the stressed life is to say giving annihilates the spirit of poverty. I had to look, like I'm typing it and it kept coming up with a little red line under it because I don't know how to spell the word annihilate, all right? I'm like, that's a good word. We all know what it means, but we don't spell it out too often. But here's what I know. A lot of people I meet, they come to church, they put on the prayer request, Pray for me financially. We're struggling. Pray for my finances. Pray for my finances. And guys, we're committed to helping you and we want to help you and we certainly do pray for you. But then I also started taking note that, man, I've been praying for some people for a really long time. Praying for some people for a really long time. They're battling a spirit of poverty that keeps them held down. It's not a godly spirit. It's an evil spirit to keep them from God's best for their life. And what we have to do is we have to annihilate the spirit of poverty. And the answer is through giving. Because giving takes the mindset off of me. Giving takes the mindset away from my greed, my selfishness, my jealousy, what I desire, what I want. Giving says it's not about me, it's about people. It's about other people. It annihilates that spirit of poverty. Now here's the deal. As I deliver this message right now, here's what's going to happen. I'm gonna call it out. This spirit of poverty sits on many of the people that are right here and many in our online campus today. Do not log off right now. You need to stay tuned in, stay plugged in because here's what the deal is. The spirit knows I'm, I'm, I'm literally calling it out right now. 
I'm calling it out. It knows what I'm saying is the word of God and it's truth. And as it does that, here's what it's gonna have the tendency to do for you. It's gonna say, don't listen to that. Don't believe that. Don't follow that. You could never do that. The math doesn't work. It won't work for you. It may work for everybody else. It doesn't work for you. All those things are gonna come through your mind. You know why? Because I'm at war right now with that spirit that's trying to oppress you. But here's the deal. As much as I know it's there, it knows that I'm here and it's more scared of me than I am of it. I'm about to annihilate that spirit of poverty, but I need a little bit of help from you. I need you to have some faith to believe God. I need you to believe God. You're not listening to Pastor Randy give you a word today. I wanna give you the word of God straight from the Bible so you can see what this is all about because giving takes it off of us and puts it towards other people. Now watch, right here, there's a question. What was Jesus' mission? What was Jesus' mission? When he came to this earth, the simple answer is found in Luke 19, 10. Jesus came to do what? To seek and save. Oh, guys, y'all, y'all, y'all forgot. You're at Revolution Church, man. We're not at the church up the street. You're at Rev Church, all right? Rev Church, here we go. Let's try it again. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Man, it's pretty packed up in here. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He was on mission to find us, to find us. Listen, we were lost and without hope, without Jesus. He was on mission to seek us out. He came to us. That's what I love about Christianity, man. You don't have to do all these things to work your way to God. You don't have to do it all these things, ducks in a row before you come to Jesus. Listen, Jesus was on mission to seek you out. And listen, it's not just seek you. Hey, there you are. It's, hey, I'm gonna save you because you're lost. I'm gonna save you because you're lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And so my question today is kind of throw it out there and then we'll go into the teaching. Will you help Revolution Church seek and save the lost? Two, because our mission as a church, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as disciples, is to go out into a world and help seek and save those who are lost, those that are without hope, those that are depressed, discouraged, frustrated, can't find the answer, spinning in that wheel against that spirit of poverty. It's our job to say, here's the answer, here's the remedy, here's what will help you in your life. We wanna help seek and save the lost. Now stats show us that, the, that, that they did stats that um, basically surveyed the top 20% of wealthiest people in the world, top 20%. And they said, how much on average do the wealthiest people give? What percentage of their income would they give away? And we found that uh, the more money you have, the less you give actually. You always thought it was the other way. Well, when I have more money, I'll give. No, 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 the more money you have, the less you give. The top uh, 20%, they only gave 1% of their income away. The more money they had, the actual less they gave. And then the bottom 20%, when I say the, the bottom, I mean the poorest people that we know, they gave 3% of their income away. So why is it that you know the, the people with less give more? I believe it's because they understand the need a little bit better. They understand the need a little bit better. See, when you've had your light shut off and you've sat in a dark room and you're explaining to your children, hey, the lights are gonna be off for a couple days, you understand the need a little differently. When somebody else struggles, you're more willing to share, you're more willing to be generous, you're more willing to give, right? When you don't know where your next meal is gonna come from and you don't know how you're gonna eat, and somebody is generous to you and, and provides for you and somehow you were able to live another day, whenever that happens again and you're able to do it, you have a little tendency to share a little bit differently because you're like, hey, this is a big deal. When you don't have as much, you understand the need better. Doesn't mean that rich people can't give. It just says statistically, it shows that they haven't been. They only give 1%. When it comes to this idea of giving, a lot of people have the mentality, well, you know, I'll give when I have more money. No, you won't. No, you won't. If you can't give now, you can't give later. If you can't give now, you can't give later. Well, I don't agree. Well, okay, you can be wrong. Okay? <laughs> Just the way that it is. Okay? What does Jesus say about giving? What's Jesus say about giving? And he, he gives us a scripture right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, remember this. Now, I like when Jesus in his teaching, when he starts off a sentence with remember this, because he said a whole bunch of stuff. He could have just started every sentence with, hey, remember this, it's all important, right? But he, he's like, no, this one specifically, I want you to remember this. He says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. In other words, those who give sparingly are gonna receive back sparingly. 
And those who give generously, those who sow generously are gonna reap generously. Now, as I go into a conversation with you about giving, you, we can't ignore this verse that God is like saying, hey, when you give, I will bless you. That is essentially what this verse is saying. And I could show you multiple scriptures all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, about this same type of philosophy. So I don't wanna ignore this, but I also don't want you to walk away going, if I give to God, he's gonna give me all this stuff. Here's the, here's the little line that I like to say, okay? We give to give, we don't give to get. Okay, we give to give because we wanna give. We wanna be obedient to God. We wanna be people who make a difference. We wanna love people well. We give to give, we don't give to get. So there's two principles there. So this is what Jesus says about giving. And I need you to understand that every single thing that we have is a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. And you say, well, wait a second, pastor. I went out and I worked hard for all that stuff and, and I worked many hours with my blood and my sweat and my tears and I clawed my way to the top to get everything I had. And I say, I understand what you, you, you believe in and what you've told yourself, but at the end of the day, everything we have is not ours. We're not the owners of our possessions. We're just the managers of his possessions. We're just managing what he has given to us and what he's blessed us with. And students, I gotta say, I'm so excited to preach this message specifically to you. Hey, it's for everybody, but specifically to you because I understood this philosophy back when I turned 12 years old. I was, I was a preteen just going into the youth ministry and I learned this and it absolutely transformed my life for forever. Like I would never go back to doing it the other way. I'm too blessed to be stressed, right? I don't wanna live that life. A lot of other people though, they've never learned this. And so at the end of the day, they live stressed life instead of blessed life. And I want you to live different. I want everybody in this room to live different. This is for everybody. But man, if the students can get this now, it's gonna change your life. And I know we say, oh, I, I'm the one that did all this. No, you're not. I, I got bad news for you. No, you're not. The only reason you were able to go to your job and do what you do is because God gave you feet. God gave you hands to go to work. Well, I did all this. Yeah, God gave you the skill in your mind with your brain to be able to go do that. He's the one that gave you breath in your lungs, not just that day, but every day of your life. You walked in here today based on God's grace and his goodness and his mercy to you. Don't be telling me how you did all this. Don't even go there, bro. Don't even go there. Because at the end of the day, we're not the owners of any of this stuff. We're just managing what God has given to us. So what does God want us to do with our money? Now, the simple answer here is financially support his church. Now, the church is known as the bride of Christ. We, as people, we are the bride of Christ, the bride. Now, think about this. Jesus loves his bride, and he wants us to take care of his bride. He's left earth, and he's gone to heaven, and he says, I'm going to prepare a place for those that, that give their life to Jesus. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to return for you one day. But while I'm gone, Christians, disciples, followers of Jesus, y'all gotta take care of the bride. You take care of the bride. Make sure this happens. This is a big deal to me. I want you to love my bride well. And a lot of people I know, they go, well, gosh, I love Jesus. I just can't stand his church. Do you understand how offensive that is to God? That's the equivalent of somebody walking up to me and saying, pastor, I love you, but I can't stand your wife. Ooh, I'll say it again, Danny. He says, Get, hit me again with it. That's the equivalent of you walking up to me and saying, Pastor, we love you. You're awesome, but I can't stand your bride. That's what we're saying whenever we don't financially give and support the bride of Christ, his church. Couldn't be more offensive to God. You know, by the way, if you say that to me, Danny, up in the hallway here, you, you're likely to get one of these fists, all right? You catch a hand, catch these hands, right? That might happen. That might happen. I kind of want it to happen. I do want to hit you and I want to have a legal reason. I love you, man. I love you. <laughs> Trying to bait him on from the platform. <laughs> Come tackle me. All right, let's keep going. Here's where the teaching comes in. Here's the Bible, Malachi chapter three. Guys, listen, there's a lot of really important scriptures in the Bible. Salvation, giving our lives to Jesus, that is above all. Like, hey, I want you to know God. 
Then I could teach you about, hey, God says, you know, the greatest of all the commandments is to love him and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That would be like one of the top five messages. If I could preach top five, I'd preach, you know, know who God is and then love your neighbor as yourself. But right here, this is in my top five of messages. I love preaching. See, most pastors are like, I don't want to talk about money. People are all, you know, weirded out about money. And, and, you know, they start thinking about all this stuff that's not true or this or that. And I just don't want to even talk about it. And I'm like, dude, every time I talk about money, people give their life to Christ. More people, by the way, statistically, more people give their life to Christ in a giving message than any other message I preach. It's the weirdest thing in all the world, okay? Like, I can't even understand other than just, like, God does it, right? God shows up. But I'm telling you, this right here can change your life. This right here has the power to change your life if you understand what I tell you right here. Ready? The Bible says in Malachi chapter three, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Now, this is not a a trick question for you. Does the Lord change, yes or no? no? No, he doesn't change, okay? One more time. I, the Lord, do not change. Hold on to that thought. I, the Lord, do not change. Then he teaches, he says, so you, the descendants of Jacob are not destroyed, which is actually really good news. Okay, because you're like, what what kind of verse are you bringing up here, pastor? Well, listen, we're messed up people and he's gonna explain why we're messed up and we deserve honestly to be separated from him for forever. But he's like, no, wait, you're a descendant of Jacob. And so because you're a descendant of Jacob, you're not destroyed. Who's Jacob? Who's Jacob? Well, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and these are three patriarchs. They're like the fathers of the faith, right? These are like the the best guys that like catalyst out the gospel of Jesus Christ. They said it from the very beginning, right? They're the patriarchs of the faith. And God made a specific promise to Jacob, and he said, listen, I'm going to bless you with more descendants than there are stars in the sky and more descendants than there is little pieces of sand on the seashore. I'm gonna truly bless you. I'm gonna walk with you. I'm gonna be with you generationally. You and I are part of the generation of Abraham. And and listen, we're protected. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. You say, what's he wanting to destroy us for? Man, this is a frustrating thing. He says, ever since the time of your ancestors, look what we've done. You've turned away from my decrees and you've not kept them. He says, you need to return to me, return to me, and I will return to you. Return to me, and I'll return to you. He says, how are we to return? Don't don't sleep on this. Listen, everybody wake up. Look, look, look. He says, will a mere mortal rob God? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. You rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? He says, in tithes and in offerings. So we don't just give a tithe. He says, it's beyond just tithes, it's offerings too. He says, you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. And then don't miss this. I said, if you wanna move from the stressed life to the blessed life, you gotta do something. Here's why we're so stressed. Because when you're not giving, you are under a curse. You say, pastor, this is, this is pretty strong teaching here. I don't know if I like this. I'm gonna send you an email this week. <laughs> Guys, I won't even see it. I've got people that, that filter my inboxes and whenever they come up with stuff that's like not biblical and like super critical and negative, they just delete it for me. I don't even ever see it, okay? So don't waste your time. If you really wanna be frustrated and you're frustrated over this, I want you to consider talking to God about it because I didn't write the Bible. Like, like I didn't get to have my name as a book of the Bible. I wish there was a Randy chapter two, verse three, you know? I'm not in the Bible. We're talking about our boy Malachi here, okay? Malachi gets to be here. God wrote this, and and God says, you've been robbing me in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, even your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Because you are robbing me. Woo! Some people living with that spirit of poverty in that hamster wheel. You've been robbing God. You're cursed. And you're not gonna be able to break that curse until you do what Jesus says. Let's keep walking through this. What does the word tithe mean? What's the word tithe mean? He says, you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. Well, simply put, it's 10% of our gross income. 10%, so if you you have income coming in, 10% off the top should be dedicated towards God, towards his work 
in a local church. You say, well, pastor, I don't wanna give to this church. Well, then go give to a different church. It's not about us getting your tithes. It's, It's not about what we want from you. It really is what we want for you. I want you to understand that the curse can be lifted and the spirit of God can work in your life. And I always have people that kind of push back, well, man, I, I don't know, I need this 100% of my income. Dude, you're so much better with 90% of your income that's blessed rather than 100% of your income that's cursed. Promise you, promise you, promise you. 10% of our income. Now I've heard people, you know, they, they, they say little things like, you know, uh, I don't know, pastor. I don't know if we can, what if they misuse the gift? You know, when I go to give, what if the church misused? I don't wanna give because they're gonna misuse my gift. Anybody ever heard anybody say that? They're gonna misuse my gift or the church gonna do something wrong with it? Or maybe you've said it, I don't know. Maybe you heard yourself say it. You can raise your hand if you heard yourself say it. Uh, At the end of the day, there's that mentality that's kind of like that. And I'm just gonna tell you that it's not the response, nowhere in the Bible do we see that it's the responsibility of the Christian to make sure that the gift isn't misused. The responsibility of the Christian is to go be obedient to God and to give. Now that doesn't mean that there's not accountability for church leadership, because I believe the people that are gonna stand before God one day and give an account for all those donations that come in is the church leadership. I believe that they're gonna stand before God and have to give an account. And that's why at our church, you know, this idea of what if they misuse the gift, uh, we set up a board of trustees and this group of people has been elected to basically see all the income that comes in, all the expenses, and to make sure that we're not making boneheaded moves at the church, right? We're not wasting money, we're not taking money, we're not doing unethical things with money, that we're literally taking the gift that God's given us and utilizing it to impact the world around us. I'm gonna share in a few minutes how we utilize that money because I wanna be super transparent with you and show you, but I'm telling you this this curse kind of looks like this. If I was to modernize, what does this curse look like? I would say it's kind of like whenever people buy a brand new house and maybe this is you, this has happened to you. They buy a brand new house and all of a sudden the roof starts leaking. You're like, dude, this is a brand new house. This shouldn't be happening. That's what we call living under the curse. Living under the curse is, is whenever you, you shouldn't have something happen to you, but it always just seems to happen over and over and over again. Everything just seems to be very difficult and hard all the time. I got a printer. I put the ink cartridge in. I press print. It doesn't work. Hello, somebody. Can I get an amen? Right? Like, like, what is up with this? Why would this be this way? Wife comes over, hits the button. It works fine. You're under the curse, right? Like, I, like what is happening? And we got to relieve this curse off of us. So I'm gonna be transparent, tell you what we do as a church, kind of how we operate and what we do with the gifts as they're given. I wanna show you, okay, three things you need to know. Oh, how could I possibly miss this great verse right here? I wanna tell you this. He says in, in the rest of the verse, 10 through 12, he says, bring the whole tithe. Now don't, don't sleep on that. Bring the whole tithe. In other words, 10% we've established is the tithe. He says, make sure you bring the whole tithe. A lot of you guys, you bring the whole tithe and you go, okay, you can have this much of the whole tithe. I'm gonna give $25 today, right? That's not a tithe. That's a piece of the tithe. But if we're gonna obey God, the Bible says you bring the whole tithe. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. This is what God says. This is what God says, so that there may be food in my house. My house. And what we do here at Revolution Church is we provide spiritual food to people who are hungry. This place, when this pandemic hit, listen, there's a reason why churches were deemed essential. And I believe they're more essential now than ever. And there's lots of groups that are essential, but I'm telling you, the church in this season of time, there are more people depressed, discouraged, anxiety-filled, frustrated, and suicidal than any other point on record. Right now, we're living that. And we're here for such a time as this. We give spiritual food to fill people up spiritually so that they can be all that God wants them to be and not just survive, but thrive as people. This is what God wants for us. So he says, so that there may be food in my house. And then do not miss this. He says, test me in this. This is the only spot in the Bible that I recommend that you test God. There's never another area of your life where I say, you should try to test God with that. Listen, if you try to test God in the wrong area, I always think of Rocky IV. You will lose, right? Y'all remember? You will lose. If he dies, 
he dies, right? Like, you don't want to test God except for where he gives us permission to test him. He's given us permission. He says, hey, I want you to test me with your tithes and offerings, says the Lord Almighty, and then look at the promise. This is where we move from stressed over to blessed. He says, I want to see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that there will not even be enough room for you to receive it. Wow, that's a promise right there. That's a promise right there. Some good promises in the Bible. That's a really good one. In other words, there's so much blessing that I can't carry all these around, God. This is too much for me. Y'all, I don't want you to live this stress life any longer. This is the blessed life I'm talking about. I want you to walk around going, God, I just can't handle any more blessings. I can't handle any more blessings. Can you imagine living a life like that? I can. Others of you I know can. And you can attest to it because you've lifted that spirit of poverty off your life. Your life has changed. Three things you need to know about your church, okay? Oh, mm, 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 it gets even better. Woo! I wanna tell you the three things you should know about your church, but we're not ready yet. He says, he says, God, this is his promise. He says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. Because keep in mind, the people he's talking to you in this moment, they're all farmers. Their livelihood comes from their crops. What they eat and how they provide for their kids and their family and everything, it comes based on this crop growing up right. They sell these crops so other people can buy it from them so they can eat. He says, here's what I'm gonna do. The blessed life looks like I'm gonna prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields, they're not gonna drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. This is pretty cool. I don't know if you've ever eaten a bite of fruit that wasn't quite ripe yet. You, you're like, oh, I want this, this juicy peach. It's gonna be so good. You, and it's hard. And you're like, oh, this thing isn't ripe yet. And you throw it away. These guys, the blessed life for them was, hey, this fruit's not gonna drop down from this vine until it's ready. Everything's gonna be in the hands of God and I'm gonna take care of you. Super, super cool, super cool. Then all nations will call you, who I like this word, blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This is the only area in the Bible where you can test him like this. This is huge. If you download what I've just talked to you about today, your whole life is gonna change. A year from now, you're gonna wake up and you're gonna go, I don't even understand. And then you're gonna go, wait a second. Yeah, I do understand. I fully understand. Three things you need to know about your church is that we tithe off the tithe. What does that mean? It means uh, you give 10% of your income, your gross income to the church. And the first thing that we do with it is go, how can we get rid of 10% of this money and bless somebody else? Can we do something else for somebody else right off the top? There's gotta be a need somewhere. We're gonna take 10% of this immediately, whatever is given, and we're gonna go bless somebody. And what's really cool about this is just here recently, about two, three weeks ago, we were able to bless another church uh, that get them, in, keep in mind, in the middle of a pandemic, they were portable, not sure how they were gonna even be able to meet next, okay? Schools are closed down, everything's locked down, you're not able to meet. We were able to help them uh, get into a better situation. This email says, hey, Pastor Randy, what an incredible blessing you and Revolution Church are to us at Encounter Church. The matching gift you gave helped us complete our giving campaign of $41,000. We had the opportunity to move into a facility where we would no longer be portable or even semi-portable. We were $6,680 away and only had about nine days left. Pastor Randy offered a matching gift and that was all it took to get other people to give that little extra. Some more great news. Our giving campaign had to be completed in eight weeks. And because of your generosity, we finished a little over a week sooner. We are so grateful for all you've done for us. And we are praying blessing and favor over you and celebrating your overwhelming kindness. Much love, Chris and Tracy Binion Encounter Church. Super cool that we get to be a part of this. Listen, that church wouldn't have even been able to meet like there was no, like they're portable. They're preaching the gospel today at church, right? To who knows how many people. We get to do this. This is part of where your money goes to. We look for needs in the community, people who are struggling, and we meet those needs. Second thing that we do, super important, uh, the budget is based on 90% of what we received the previous year. So let me just give you some simple math. Let's say that last year we took in $100. Simple math, $100. 
we would say, okay, well, we're gonna budget off of 90% of that. We're not gonna budget off 100 and say, well, we're gonna grow and we're gonna have 110% budget. No, we're not doing any of that stuff. First thing we're gonna do is say, we're gonna budget off of 90% because we believe there needs to be some room for savings, some room for savings. And this is a principle that we do as a church, but it's a principle you should be doing in your life as well. It looks like this. We're to give first, save second, and we live on the rest. You give first, save second, live on the rest. Say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Give first, save second, live on the rest. We give first, we save second, we live on the rest. This is just being healthy. This is just being wise with what God has blessed us with. This is being a good manager and steward of what he's given to us. Give first, save second, live on the rest. Now to pull this off and stay healthy as a church, number three, we ask everyone to participate in tithing, in tithing. Notice I didn't say in giving, I said in tithing, in tithing. We ask everyone, everyone to participate in tithing. Now, I wanna dream with you a little bit about what, what could be. And I also wanna share with you where we are, okay? Because I believe that transparency is super important. I believe the more transparent you are with people, uh, the more they want to give. I believe people want to give. I just think they've seen some leaders in the past that have put their, their mindset and their faith down when it comes to giving. And they're like, I just don't trust people anymore. So the more transparent we can be, the better. So let me kind of walk this through with you, okay? I, I was doing some math. I'm a numbers guy. How many of y'all are numbers people? You like numbers. You like numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, put your hands up. How many of y'all don't like numbers? Put two hands up. Two hands up. All right, all right, all right. I promise, I promise, I promise I'm not going to bore you with all of it. Okay, but I do want you to st stay zoned in for about five minutes with me, okay? I looked up some numbers and I looked up what is the annual household income? Two married people working together, right? Two married people in a household working together in Princeton, McKinney, and Frisco. And I said, how much money do they make per year? You can look this up in your Google. Ask Siri, she'll pull it up for you, all right? It says in Princeton, you're gonna make 64,000 a year, 83,000 in McKinney, and in Frisco uh, is gonna be 112,000. So I took Princeton because we're right next to Princeton. We're in McKinney and I took Frisco because we're five minutes away from there. So what is this? So, so by the way, don't we all just know based on this, we need jobs in Frisco. Can I get an amen, somebody? All right, like, hey, we're getting cheated over here. We're like five minutes away. What's up with that? Right, what's up with that? So, so I was looking at this and I was thinking, okay, if this is what this is and people hate math as much as y'all say you do, okay, tie 10%. How do I figure out what my tithe is? Really simple way to do it is, is, is really simple. You just take whatever your annual income is and you write it down on a piece of paper and then you just cross out the last zero, the last zero. So if you're making 64,000 a year, your tithe is 6,400. If you're in McKinney and it's 83,000, what do you do? Cross out that last zero, just cross out that last zero, 8,300. Frisco, man, come on somebody, go get a job in Frisco. Okay, cross out that last zero, your tithe should be $12,000. If everybody goes gets a job in Frisco, we can change the world, right? You gotta give still and we can change the world, but that's the math. So, so, so for all the people that hate math, it's really not as complicated as we think it is. We just figure out how much do I make per year, delete that last zero, and that's what your tithe should be. Now I was doing some more math for you math nerds that just love math. Let me just take it a step further, okay? Take it a step further, okay? We have about 700 people that call Revolution Church their home church. About 700 people attend, say, that's my church, man. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do some math. If I take the numbers of, of what people make in this area and I subtract away the 200 kids that we have at Revolution Church, because we have children's ministry and we have youth ministry and a lot of these guys aren't working quite yet. They don't have jobs, so they're not tithing and giving. So let's deduct off the top of that 700 number, 200 people off. So now we're down to 500 people that could potentially tithe. But then we say, you know what? We, this number is based on two married people together, household income. So it's not fair to take a number times 500. Let's just cut it in half. Let's cut it in half. And you know, there's somebody single in here going, it doesn't work. Well, there's other single people in the room. You pair each other up, you know, y'all get married and your life will change. It's great, right? <laughs> the math still works the same, okay? And we cut that in half, we say there's 250 people that are potential tithers. And if we use the number from Princeton, the smaller amount of all the three amounts, of $6,400, here's what the annual offering should look like. It should be $1,600,000. 
wow, that's a good amount of money right there. Like, whoa, we can change the world with $1,600,000. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Can change the world with money like that coming in. And that's, that's just quick math of me going, where, where should we be? What should our tithe and offering look like? Now, if I take this number and I divide it by 12 months to see how much are we gonna, what's our monthly budget? Like how much per month, each month? And I, I did this math here. Monthly church budget should equal $133,000. Here's what we take in monthly, $55,000. That's a difference of $78,000. You know what that tells me as a pastor? We got a spirit of poverty worn against us. We got a spirit of poverty worn against us. You know why that spirit of poverty does what it does? Because it knows if you start researching your church to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, whoo, it doesn't just annihilate a spirit of poverty, but it makes the enemy turn and run the opposite direction. It's terrified, terrified. But you know what? He's terrified us as Christians. We're more scared of him. And the truth is, he's actually more scared of us. Our potential in this room is unbelievable. One million, six hundred thousand dollars. You know, y'all keep talking about changing the world. Why don't you actually come and change the world with us? Why don't you actually be a part of what God's doing to change the world? Guys, I love you, but you've got to break this spirit of poverty in your life. So the question is asked, will you partner with us to change lives and give people hope in McKinney? Will you do it? It's a question I'm asking you. I'm politely asking you. Will you obey God? Will you trust God? And, and that, I think that is the, the boiled down question is, do you trust God with your finances? Do you trust God with your finances? And the best way to know whether you trust God is if you're willing in this area of your life to have some faith. Now, at our church, we do what I don't think any other church does. I haven't heard of any other church around here doing anything like this. I know my brother in California does this because we are just crazy people. I know my younger brother in Houston, he's a pastor as well. He does this. We offer what we call the 90-day giving challenge. 90-day giving challenge. You say, what, what is that about? Well, lean in. I want you to give faithfully the full tithe. That's the full 10% of your gross income. You're going to give the full tithe for 90 days. 90 days, and basically what we're doing is we're giving you a money back guarantee. We're giving you a money back guarantee. At the end of 90 days, we will refund all your donations if God doesn't come through. You know what bet I'm making? I'm making a bet that God's gonna be who he says he is. I'm making a bet that at the beginning of our verse, it said, I, the Lord, do not change. Y'all remember that verse? I, the Lord, do not change. Because there's some people, well, well, pastor, that's in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi. And, you know, we're not under the Old Testament anymore. We're in the New Testament now. And I hear people say that and I go, bro, did you just read the verse that says, I, the Lord, do not change? Like he's literally telling us, this is my position on this issue right here. I'm not changing this. And he said, listen, test me in this. And see if I'm not gonna overthrow the windows of heaven on you and pour out so much blessing that you don't even have enough room to receive it. I'm literally making this as simple as I possibly can to say, there's really no risk to you. There's absolutely no risk to you. No risk to you. And yet you have everything to gain. And I hear people kind of resist back. Again, that spirit of poverty kind of creeps in there and they go, you know, you just don't have the money to do that. You could never do that. Everybody else can do that, but you, you, you just, it doesn't work on paper for you. And I say, listen, I know you think you can't afford to give and I'll hear you tell you, you can't afford not to give. You can't afford not to give. I'm tired of the enemy taking good people like you out. Tired of it. You'll thank me one day. As a matter of fact, I got an email uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, from a gentleman in our church. And he says, hi, Randy. Uh, back in August, I started tithing for the first time in my life. I didn't grow up in a religious family, which by the way, you don't have to grow up in a religious family to give to God, okay? Just heads up, okay? I wasn't looking at tithing as if I was buying good luck from God, but I can't help but notice that since I started tithing, that good news just keeps on coming. Over the past, overall, the past two months have been pretty good. But I wanna tell you about one particular week where God was really showering me with blessings. It was the first week of September. First, I won an award. I'm not sure if I told you this, but I'm a filmmaker. 
A short film that I directed has been screening at film festivals over the past year and a half, and I received an email that week from one of the festivals that was postponed due to COVID that my film won the award for best drama. That's pretty cool, pretty cool. The next day, I had a phone call with some prospective clients at Procter & Gamble about a commercial that I have been pitching to them for several months. Do you remember that email I sent you back in March about the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans? PNG has done a lot of socially conscious commercials about racial bias in the past, and this commercial that I've been pitching to them addresses those issues of Asian targeted racism. Well, one day after I got the good news from the film festival about the award, I'm on a call with PNG and I found out that I'm going to be directing a commercial for them. That's awesome. So yeah, that was a pretty good week. Oh, and one more thing. Two days later, my wife Lee and I found out that we were having a baby. Yeah, woo! Lee and I are beyond grateful for this gift. We're both in our 30s, so there was definitely some concern about whether or not we could get pregnant. We both know many people who have struggled and have been unable to conceive. When Lee and I started trying, we prayed and prayed that God would give us a baby, and now we got a little raspberry-sized human in her belly. It's incredible the good fortune that's come since I started tithing. I'm continuing to tithe regardless of whether I'm going through good times or bad, but these past two months have really solidified my faith that God truly does provide. Anyway, I hope this news of God's good work has somehow brightened your day and I'll see you Sunday. Can we just say how awesome God is right there? That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, for some of you, for some of you, tithing is a challenge. You, I just can't. And I'm asking you to stop, stop looking at paper in the natural when you do your budget. And I want you to look at your budget with the supernatural inserted in. Because the Bible teaches us that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I want to remind you that he owns those hills too. He owns those hills too. I've heard people say, well, what about my job? What about this? And what if this happens? Listen, God can give you that job. He can change your hours. He can give you a raise. He can give you a different job. It's triple the amount of money. He can make you move to Frisco and get a job. Somebody give me an amen on that, all right? Something's gonna happen with all that because God is the one in control of all of our finances. It's just when you look at it in the natural on paper, it's always gonna look bad. When you take God out of it, of course it looks that way, okay? Let me me finish this up. So what can you trust God with this year? What can you trust God with this year? And I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer you on something here because I get, I get fired up about this kind of stuff. I like people that like to debate. How many of y'all like to debate people? Come on, you like to debate. Yeah, you're my people. Argumentative. Yes. Okay. Help me out with some theology here because I, I'm real messed up on this one. Real messed up on this one. Maybe you can shed some light. And I'm just going to be honest and say I'm kind of being a little bit sarcastic up here. Kind of being a little bit of sarcastic, Randy, today. Because for some reason, Christians believe that a guy died on a cross, was buried, crucified, and three, not like he died, not just a little bit dead, like, hey, he's a little bit dead. No, 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 like, like died, died, like, like gone, died, like starting to stink after a couple days, right? Y'all know what I'm saying? Like died, like gone. Christians believe that he died and was buried, but then somehow resurrected and came back to life. They have no trouble believing that, but they have a whole lot of trouble trusting God with 10% of their finances. Y'all's theology is a little bit messed up. Like we either believe God can do anything or we don't. We either believe he can do anything or, or you don't. What can you trust God with this year. I'm going to challenge you to get on the right path with God. And I have one last question. If everyone in this church gave to this church the way that you give to this church, would our church thrive or would it barely survive? Consider that. And I'm going to ask you to get on the right path with God in this area of your life and go from stressed to blessed. And I want you to see where the money goes because I got another email. I love when I get emails. I always go, is somebody mad or are they super happy? (laughs) Nobody's ever in between, by the way. Nobody's ever in between. Here's what this email says. It says, Dear Revolution Church, this is to you guys that give. To you guys that give, this is to you. Dear Revolution Church, as my family is in severe financial crisis, I searched the internet desperately looking for local food pantries with perishable food and reached out to your church requesting food assistance. 
Our prayers were answered the next day when I received an email from Rita informing me that Revolution Church would like to purchase some groceries for us. She asked what we needed, went shopping, and then came to our house and brought us your gift of food. Oh my goodness. I was overcome with joy and relief. Words cannot fully express how I am feeling. God is so good. And Rita did a wonderful job. Now we have a full refrigerator, full stomachs, and full hearts, and we are so grateful for your help. Thank you so much. This financially difficult period in our lives has taught me, my husband, and our son many lessons about hardship, hunger, and charity. We pray that the world will soon recover from COVID-19 and that our startup company will be as successful as projected and provide us with the opportunity to be able to make a difference and help those in need and also to repay those such as you who gave us a lifeline and rescued us when we needed it the most, the Hetzel family. Come on, let's celebrate what God is doing. Mark Simmons was here early this morning. He shared with me that the food pantry yesterday fed 50 families, which equates to about 200 people. Guys, this is what we get to do. This is what we get to do. As affluent of an area as we live in, there are still people that are hungry and in need. We get to do this. And I'm challenging you to get in, in, in the right path with God challenging you it's a challenge it's a challenge you know I often get mad and I go God why'd you have to put that uh, in the last you know why'd you put all this in the last book of the Old Testament why didn't you put it in the New Testament you know what I feel like God said I put it right where I want it because giving is a test he says test me in this let's bow our heads in prayer let's bow our heads in prayer Father God in the name of Jesus today we come to you Lord And God, I pray for these people, my brothers and sisters right now, Lord. I pray for these students in the room listening to this message as well. I pray for everyone here that's watching online, Lord. I thank you for them, and I thank you for your word that gives us truth. God, I pray that today would be a revival financially for everybody listening to the sound of my voice. If you're watching on demand later on, I pray that God blesses you financially as we annihilate the spirit of poverty in our lives. The answer is giving. The answer is giving. Takes away selfishness, greed, and jealousy. The answer is giving. God, I pray blessings over these people. I pray that they download what's been said. God, I pray they take that 90-day challenge. Guys, when you go to give online at RevChurchTX.com, there's a little spot where you can write in the memo, 90-day challenge. You can click the tab that says 90-day challenge. Let us know you're taking that 90-day challenge. You know, every time I write my tide check or I go online, I always write something in the memo. I say, God, I pray that you bless this money to feed hungry people. I pray that you use this money to give the gospel to places that it hasn't gone before. I pray that we start more churches with it and do more missions work with it. I pray that we reach more into our community and make a difference. I always pray that over my gift as I give it. I write it in the memo. And you know, you guys don't see that, but I know our accounting team, they see it. They see what we write in the memo section there because it's our prayer, it's our heart. God, multiply these funds in great ways for your kingdom. I gotta be honest and say, I'm I'm kinda tired of hearing people say they wanna go change the world, but then not do anything to change the world. It's right in front of us. If you don't trust me on it, why don't you come and serve in our food pantry one week? Why don't you come meet some of those families? Why don't you see tears running down their eyes? Why don't you see the hugs that they give to you in the middle of a pandemic? They know they're not supposed to hug you, but they do it anyways. They didn't know where the next meal was coming from. This is what we get to do. I'm so blessed that we get to do it, but, but we need help. We need help. We need help. We, there's so many more people to reach. We need to do more. Everybody look up here real quick. This is so important. This is so important. You know, maybe, maybe today's your very first day in church. And somebody invited you here and they go, Pastor, oh man, out of all the weeks to have my friend come. Are you kidding me, preacher? What are you doing? Listen, 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 listen. I want to I want to I want to affirm everybody in this room and tell you that God doesn't ever make a mistake. He's never made a mistake. Your guest is here on purpose. 
And right here, I want you to know, if you didn't get anything else out of this, I want you to know there's a God in heaven that sees you, loves you, knows all the good and all the bad that's happened in your life up to this point. And he says, I've done something to get to you. I want a relationship with you. You know what I love about Christianity? All other religions say, this is what you have to do to get to God. But Christianity says, this is what God did to get to you. He left heaven. He died on a cross. He paid for sin. And he said, if you'll put your faith and trust in me, you can have a home in heaven for all of eternity, but you can live what we call the blessed life here on this earth. You don't have to survive. You can thrive. But it starts with giving your life to Jesus Christ, acknowledging your need for him. So if you're here today and you're a guest, let me just tell you, your friend invited you here probably for this moment of time, probably for this right here. Because they know not if you meet Pastor Randy or Pastor Anthony or Pastor Danny or some other person here that's a friend. That's not what's gonna change your life. They know that if you meet the God of the universe, the God that spoke the earth into existence with the sound of his voice, that powerful God that owns it all, that's above it all. If you meet him, it's gonna change and transform everything for you. That's why they invited you here. You say, well, I don't know if I believe all that. Well, man, you're challenging something that's pretty big because there are thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions of people that gather together every weekend to come and worship a savior that has transformed our lives. And we're living proof existence that God does the stuff that he says that he does in his word. We're living proof of it. We're not just up here for no reason. God's up to something. And our friends that invited us, they wanted you to have that too. So let me lead you through the commitment prayer. Just repeat this after me if you're ready to give your life to God. You'll never be the same. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit and guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. People, let's welcome people into the family of God. Come on, woo! All right, all right, all right. If you just prayed that prayer and gave your life to Jesus, do me a favor, pull out your phone right now, pull out your phone right now and text the word new me, new me to the number 31996. New me with no spaces, new me, no spaces to 31996. I wanna celebrate with you the decision that you made to ask God to be part of your life. The best is yet to come for you. And I'm excited to coach you along and show you what the Bible teaches on how to follow God with your life. With that being said, we're gonna say goodbye to our online campus on the count of three. One, two, three, good.